Worried about your home's furnace or AC? Not anymore. Legacy Heating and Air wants to make it easy for you to stay comfortable year-round. Right now, when you buy a new heating and cooling system from Legacy, we'll give you the complete package worry-free. Get a free smart thermostat, a free duct cleaning, flexible financing options, and free maintenance for up to 12 years. This won't last long. Call your Legacy Pro today or schedule online at LegacyHeatingAndAirInc.com. A Cook Family Business. Welcome to Football Never Sleeps and my first wave of our season. Uh, <laughs> uh, we are the aspiring to be viral Notre Dame football YouTube show that comes at you every Monday night at 7 Eastern time. Even when we roll back the clocks, we're still at 7 Eastern. We are going to be taking a look at Wake Forest, Notre Dame's next opponent, which comes to Notre Dame Stadium on Saturday for the 500th ever game played in that facility. Notre Dame is ranked 20th in a couple of the polls, the college football playoff rankings and the AP poll. They're seven and three. And we have lots to talk about tonight. There's some news on the injury front, news on the portal front, and news on the recruiting front. Tyler did not have a haircut, so no uh, news there. We also take your questions and we work them in during the course of the show. So if you have something you want to ask us, or if you want to just compliment us, or if you want a free haircut from Tyler, put your comments in the comment section, and Tyler will tell you how to do that and do all the other things that you're supposed to do during the course of the show besides just listen. Yeah, if you are new to the YouTube live experience on the right-hand side on a desktop version, there should be a chat box that's available to you. Um, you can uh, read what folks are saying and also submit your questions and uh, our comments or requests for haircuts, as Eric mentioned. Um, <laughs> and then if you're on a mobile device, uh, it, the comment section should be below our talking heads. And uh, make sure you've clicked through to either YouTube or the YouTube app. Um, because if you're watching us embedded somewhere, whether it's inside IndieSports.com, on the entire lounge, or somewhere else on social media, you won't be able to send your comments through those through those messages. We won't we won't get those if you're just replying to us on on Twitter or Facebook. We're not gonna we're not gonna be able to see those. So uh, make sure you click through. And uh, if if you're not already subscribed to Inside IndieSports.com, we hope you take uh, advantage of the 30 day free trial that we've been offering using promo code NDYT. That is an exclusive code for our YouTube audience. Um, you can sign up for free access to our, our premium analysis, recruiting coverage, and special access to us on the Insider Lounge. There's a link to sign up in the video description below. And uh, make sure you're like, subscribe, rate, review, thumbs up, only strictly thumbs ups, no thumbs downs, um, okay. and turn on your alerts to make sure you don't miss any of our um, YouTube content here from Inside Indie Sports. All right. Well, again, we'll start off with where Notre Dame is coming out of its second bye week of the season. Uh, the earlier bye week, they followed that with a 58-7 win over Pitt. They're playing another ACC team, this one Wake Forest, who's 4-6. and six. Sam Hartman, Notre Dame's quarterback, his former team. They are really struggling, particularly at the quarterback position and on offense. They are coming off of a 26-6 home loss to North Carolina State. Um, Notre Dame, I mentioned, is 20th in a couple of polls. The highest ranking is 18th, and that's in the coaches' poll. They moved up four big spots in the coaches' poll hmm. while eating cheeseburgers, which is an old Charlie Weiss-era reference uh, to his um, dismay over a team jumping the Irish during their bye week. The ReliQuest Bowl, January 1st in Tampa, remains the best case scenario for a postseason game with Notre Dame. They would play an SEC team there. Could be LSU. It could be Tennessee. Could be somebody else. That's still a very viable option for Notre Dame as long as the Irish get back to their winning ways and finish off Wake Forest and then Stanford the following week. And we should probably mention off the top here that the Stanford game does have a kickoff time at 7 p.m. Eastern time, 4 p.m. on the West Coast, and it's on the Pac-12 network, which 
may cause some of you to have to scramble to get a free trial with like Hulu or one of these other uh, sports outfits. But the very first place we're going to start is the offensive line reset because there were some injuries there. And Tyler was all over that. And being a former offensive lineman, I'm going to hand it off to him. Yeah, so the biggest news was that uh, right guard Rico's uh, Rico Rocco Spindler uh, is Rico having, and Rocco. He's re, he's Rico when he's injured. Um, he's having knee he's having knee surgery and will be out for the rest of the season. Um, unfortunate news for the first year starter, who I think had had been sort of coming into his own as the season had progressed. Um, and so what we'll see in his place will be Billy Shrouth, who finished the game in the right guard spot. Um, against Clemson and that has seen some some time there this season um, both at right and left guard um, throughout the year but very limited amounts of, of reps but someone that we anticipated early in camp as as a potential starter for Notre Dame so uh, we'll, we'll be I, I know I'll be fascinated to see how he can perform here to finish out the season and where that sets him up for next year um, and then the other news is Zeke Carell um, their name starting center is still in concussion protocol. I, if you would ask me a week ago if he would play in the in the Wake Forest game, I would have said yes. I I would still probably lean toward yes, although Marcus Freeman didn't necessarily have an answer either way. But if if uh, Zeke Carell can't go, it look it's looking like Ashton Craig would be um, in his place as the starting center because Andrew Christophic, who replaced Zeke Carell initially in the Clemson game, um, is dealing with a high ankle sprain. So. Um, to be determined how that center position plays out this week. Certainly it'll be what we asked Marcus Freeman on Thursday, um, whether or not Zeke Carell's ready to go. Um, because even though he has had um, some tough moments this season, I think it would be important to have him in there um, next to Billy Strouth. Although I guess Billy Strouth would have some experience of playing uh, with Ashton Craig. So maybe that, that could be helpful as well. Um, and I thought those guys did okay there uh, um, late in the game, but I think, uh, um, there's so, th certainly room for improvement for those guys who haven't had a, a lot of experience. Yeah, Ashton Craig actually in the pro football focus grades graded out pretty well in his 21 snaps. And he came in in a difficult time in that Clemson really knew what Notre Dame was doing during that time. It seemed like Marcus Freeman was pretty pleased with him today. And he's going to be, a, I mean, both these guys are going to be fighting to get into that starting lineup next year. Mm -hmm. you know, Billy Shrouth is a guy I um, got, what's the expression, too far over my skis, Tyler? Yeah, I think so. Uh, with, with, I thought he would be a starter this year and not only be a starter, but be a really good starter. I'm still surprised that he is not, he didn't overtake somebody at some point, but um, he'll have that opportunity this spring. And I think there's a lot of good raw material there with Billy Shrow. Uh, so then there were some. There was uh, hold on, just real quickly. I just wanted to mention. I think it's important when we talk about Ashton Craig and his performance against Clemson, which he did do a good job. But there was, I think, three running plays while he was in the game. Uh, so, I, so we didn't really get to learn much about Ashton Craig as a run blocker, and I think that's right. probably more important. It's a little bit easier to run block or pass block as a center um, versus a tackle. Um, uh, so, but obviously he still need to do that. We, we've seen Zeke Carell have his, have his laps as a, as a pass protector, but, um, I think that's important to note that, that we still, we didn't necessarily learn a lot about Ashton Craig as a run blocker in the Clemson game. Yeah. To be honest, I mean, when you look at the run blocking grades for the whole year, this has been a team, an offensive line that has had consistently higher pass block grades than it's run block. Why do you think that might be, Tyler? Just from you, you've done a lot of film reviews. Why do you think that that might have been the case this year with these guys? Yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly, I think it's tough to grade when you don't know exactly what they're supposed to do, although I think generally you have a pretty good idea. I think a lot of times, especially when Notre Dame is pulling, you might be going to the wrong guy but still blocking someone. And so maybe PFF grades you down because it's like, you know what, that's probably not the guy who's supposed to block, so let's not give him a, a good grade for that. Um, I, I don't know exactly how they're determining whether or not you get a positive grade. I, I think there's a scale. I don't think it's just positive or negative. I think I don't remember exactly what the scale is for each play. Um, but 
So I think that may have something to do with it, just the amount of pulling and the sort of unknown targets. I don't think Notre Dame's done a good job of getting off of its double teams to the second level. So I think that um, will ding uh, Notre Dame's offensive lineman there as well. Um, and I think consistency and sort of sustaining blocks uh, is another thing. And we've seen Audrey Estime as good as he's been. He's done a lot of it either after contact or by miss, making ta- making guys miss tackles. And usually some of those guys that are – being missing the tackler guys that Notre Dame should have blocked. So I think that probably all plays into um, the lower run blocking grades that, that Notre Dame has received from pro football focus this season. And there were some other injury news. I guess I'll run through those since I was wily enough to fit four questions into my two questions today. <laughs> um, Dion, <laughs> Dion Colsey, the junior who's been out quite some time now was projected for an August, uh, October return from uh, arthroscopic surgery on his knee. He's still out, which means he'll probably end up redshirting this year, whether he intends to or not. I mean, he's at four games right now. If you play him in Stanford, he's at five. If you leave him out, most likely there will be a waiver about um, playing a fifth game in the bowl game that still preserves your red shirt year. And I would look for him maybe to return then. Matt Salerno, it sounds like he's making his way to either play in a bowl game or play against Stanford. He's been out since when? September, Tyler? Yeah, it was the Tennessee State game was his last game. Tennessee State game. And then Jaden Thomas didn't end up playing in the Clemson game. Marcus was a little bit murky with his status, but it didn't sound like he was super encouraged about his availability for Saturday. They're trying to get him right. Even if he is, you wonder how much he would play if he's already missing you know, practices early in the week and uh, didn't play in the last game, didn't practice during the second bye week. So you wonder really how much is he going to be able to help Notre Dame if he's ready to go. They may hold him out one more week and have him ready for Stanford. And then Luke Talich, who's a freshman safety, he's a walk-on who I think will probably earn a scholarship next year if they have room for that. Um, He's been a special teams regular. He broke his collarbone last week during the bye week practices, and he is out for the season. Did I cover all the injury news today? Yeah, I think think that's everything. The the Jaden Thomas one um, is – the murkiest, like you mentioned, and I think like my understanding is like at times throughout the season, Notre Dame had expected to get more out of Jaden Thomas and then that hamstring issue sort of came back. And so this has sort of yeah. been a, a a vicious cycle for him and sort of getting back to where they want to. And then just one, one tweak here or there um, and you're back to square one and not being able to get, get what you need out of him. And so I imagine that's been incredibly frustrating for the coaching staff, for Jaden Thomas, for the training staff, um, to sort of have to try to figure this out and go through that. But that's something that um, happens with that, something like a hamstring issue that when, when those happened initially, we're like, this is something that probably is going to be an issue throughout the rest of the season. Um, and even though Jaden Greathouse has been able to make it back and play more, he hasn't necessarily seemed like the same player he was um, previously. So um, unfortunate for Jaden Thomas, and we'll see what, what Notre Dame can get out of him the rest of the season. Don't be shy with uh, submitting your questions. We're going to move on to a quick look at Wake Forest, and then maybe we'll uh, take some questions after this small segment here. Wake Forest at a glance. The Demon Deacons, four and six, lost at home to NC State on Saturday. They benched their starting quarterback, Mitch Griffiths. Um, Coach Dave Clawson was not happy with Michael Kearns either and he's not sure what he's going to do for the quarterback Saturday, and he proclaimed that their offense was broken. And I would agree with him in that particular game. NC State had a 21-0 lead before Wake got its initial first down. Uh, They are 93rd. This is the offense that Sam Hartman left behind. They are 93rd in rush offense, 101st in total offense, 110th in scoring offense. This is out of 130. FBS teams, 86th in pass efficiency, 128th in sacks allowed. That's third from the bottom. 
Uh, their defense is their stronger suit, and yet they're kind of a middle-of-the-pack team. They're 63rd in total defense. But the offense has put them in in bad places, I, I'd say. You know, given a – if Hartman were their quarterback, their defense would also have a higher ranking. Hmm. Uh, so that's a look at Wake Forest. Okay, do we want to plunge ahead here, Tyler, or do we have a question? Yeah, well, let's uh, go ahead and stop. We just have a couple questions, but you, it seems to be when we start answering questions, folks start chiming in with more questions. Okay. Uh, so we'll see where that leads us. And if not, we'll get back to some of the things we want to talk about, and we can jump back to questions again later. Okay. All right. First one we have is from Frank Sarah. What with the injuries to the offensive line, can Notre Dame run the ball effectively? I don't see Sam Hartman throwing the ball downfield. Well, you know, Wake is pretty balanced in their defensive approach. They're a little bit better against the run than they are in the past. They're again kind of middle of the pack and both a little bit below average in in pass defense. Um I, I again I think Notre Dame's got to be balanced and uh as Tyler suggested we haven't really seen much of Ashton Craig as a run blocker yet I would think that that just from the practices I remember in August I would think that would be Billy Shrouth's strong yeah. suit yeah so I, agree. I would feel pretty good about him I and we'll see with Ashton Craig but I mean he's it seems like all these other centers are, if not bigger, they're bigger and stronger. They're stronger than Zeke Carell. Zeke is an incredible technician. He's an incredible locker room leader. And maybe they overlook some of the inconsistencies with being overpowered because of those great traits. But I would think this is a team, I mean, this is a big step down from Clemson's defense in all facets. So I would think Notre Dame would have some success running the ball. Yeah, I think that's possible. The the thing that you would you'll run into if you have those inexperienced guys is well, how do they execute once you have to sort of change things up and once they're getting different looks from defenses that maybe they haven't seen in practice and they won't have the role. And Wake will do that. Wake is crafty with their move pre snap movement. So, so Billy Strouth and Ashton Craig won't have the same sort of Rolodex of c- scenarios that they've been through that uh, Rocco Spindler and Zeke Carell have. Certainly, Zeke Carell as as a much uh, as a long tenured offensive lineman for Notre Dame. So, so that will be an, an, an issue and something that Notre Dame will have to stress in its preparation to get those guys ready for that. Um, but in terms of like, yeah, like the physicality, I, I think those guys should be fine. Um, I think Billy Strouth. Th- run blocks with with the tenacity and sometimes that can maybe lead to some mistakes um but i think he will he will certainly not be shy about getting out there and getting after it um and, and ashton craig um moves well and he has decent size and so i think there's there's a reason to believe that he can have success doing that too so um but my, sort of what i would be looking at is like not just how they perform sort of out of the gate but like how do they how do they react once once Wake Forest is like, you know what, this isn't working for us. Let's do something different. Um, and that's something Notre Dame has struggled with its normal starting offensive line. Um, so maybe these maybe these other guys can do a better job of it. I think that's something we'll we'll have a chance to potentially learn, especially if Zeke Carell is is not out there and able to play. All right. Next question is from Jeffrey Stevens, uh, Bubakar Traore was marked as a red shirt by Marcus Freeman, surprising that his play in 2023 will be limited. Well, he's at the four-game threshold now, so he got a little bit of run here in the second half of the season. I was, I kind of thought it might be a coin flip. Here, Here's where I think Marcus is coming from with this. They don't need him from a number standpoint, like they're healthy at that position. They have three guys, Jordan Batello, mm-hmm. Josh Burnham, and Junior Tuihalamaka that have been rotating all season. They've gotten pretty good production, especially out of Burnham among the backups. Traore in the few snaps he's played, I think it's been 17 this year, has been remarkably productive in those 17 snaps. And again, when we saw him in a media open practice in August against admittedly the second and third team offensive line, which has talented players, he looked pretty good. Uh, But 
is he going to make a difference in winning or losing a game? And I think that's where Marcus kind of draws the line and says, let's, you know, hold him back and possibly have this guy around for five years. Now he may end up being good enough for, he wants to leave after three or four years. We'll see. But uh, that's, that's the thinking there. And remember these younger guys won't have the COVID option years, won't have the six years like, um, the senior class, the current seniors do, they are the last class that will have COVID option years. Yeah, we did receive some clarity from Marcus Freeman today saying that they're under the belief that guys can play in the bowl game even if they've played four regular season games, and that does not count against their uh, registered eligibility. Um, so that would And be I it. think he's he's – mistaken about that being an absolute but i'm sure that that's what's going to happen you know a waiver is going to be granted for the second straight year yeah that's that's at least how nd is operating and, and uh so i think uh certainly we won't have to find that out we won't they don't need to know for sure until december um but uh otherwise they're going to only have like 13 people in some of the bowl <laughs> games you yeah, have yeah. to play both ways yeah and so so i like for the reasons Eric mentioned that I don't know that he's like a, a requirement as someone that Notre Dame needs to beat Wake Forest uh, or Stanford. It's not terribly surprising once he didn't play in the Clemson game. Um, I think that was sort of the, 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 the signal that that would be the way this was trending. So um, I think that uh, um, I sort of understand that though. I do think he has a bright future and wouldn't have, uh, have minded seeing a, a little bit more of him. And remember, the two teams that they play to finish the regular season are 128th and 118th in sacks allowed. So Tyler may be able to get out there and get a sack. <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, next question is from Philip Eddy. Do you think the ineffective offensive line is a product of a new coach and a new system and expect things to be better next year, or do you think there is more going on? The line has underperformed. I've given this a lot of thought because it comes up in different forms in my chat. And I will say a couple things. One, I think Joe Rudolph coming in as a February edition instead of, say, a December or January, I don't think helped his cause in terms of getting all the things ready that he wanted to. Um, and I also think, you know, he's working with Jared Parker for the first time. So they're and Jared Parker's truly a first time offensive coordinator, even though he's worn that title before. So I think there were some things to work out between those two, not that it was contentious, but just maybe chemistry issues there. I, I thought the offensive line would be better at this stage of the season. I thought, you know, again, I expected some hiccups, in September, I didn't expect as many this deep in the season. Now, again, Clemson gives a lot of teams hiccups on their offensive line. They're pretty good defensive front, but they've been pretty inconsistent. How can you be that good against Ohio State and then not good against some of the other teams? And I'm not counting Clemson, but um, that's my thought is that it's more of a chemistry between the coaches I really want to see what Joe Rudolph does in the second year. The one thing he w tried to do, and I give him credit, he did not go in there and make wholesale changes, or at least that's what he said in what Harry Heastan was doing. He tried to be as consistent as he could in the teaching of what Harry was doing so that they wouldn't have to kind of start from square one. So again, I think in year two, I'm really eager to see how this plays out. Yeah, and like I, I don't know that there needed to be any sort of drastic changes, and I would be surprised if a lot of the things that Joe Rudolph teaches were significantly different than what Harry Heastan teaches. There are certain, there's certainly different ways to go about blocking, but the fundamentals are pretty, pretty standard. Um, and so I, I, I do think this offense and its running game lack an identity um and it, they're not really sure what they are all the times and i think it changes from week to week sometimes and not always in a good way 
Um, and so I think that has something to do with it. I don't know that the play calling and the offensive line have, have complemented each other well. Um, and the pass pro has been pretty good for the most part. I think there's been issues in communication um, at times and then sometimes just getting flat out beat. Um, I think you would rather get flat out beat because that's more it's it's you sort of understand what happens there. You have, have some faith that you could do better the next rep. The communication issue seems to be a little bit more complicated. And and once once a team sort of realizes that, I think they're only going to um, sort of expose that more and more and try to uh, make sure that you uh, fix fix those issues and are on the same page with guys. So um, I, I think it all sort of plays into each other. Uh, I, I don't I, – certainly, I mean, we talk about play action all the time, but a play action, like, keeps the defense – not defenses don't know always what to do against play action. That's why it's a successful uh, form of offense and Notre Dame's not doing a lot of it. So Notre Dame's either in some very run predictable formations, whether it's a pistol formation um, and uh, two tight end formations, uh, or they're in some predictable passing situations. And I, that certainly doesn't help the offensive line either. Certainly, when you're when you're an elite offensive line, you don't really care. Like we don't care if you know what's coming. We're going to be better than you. But Notre Dame has not been an elite offensive line this year, um, and so I think that uh, has prevented um, those things from being maximized on both both fronts. One thing I'll add, and maybe Tyler touched on this during that long monologue there, but um, just kidding, uh, is the running into a loaded box cer certainly makes your offensive line more right look worse and the fact that they haven't really got production out of that field receiver when you have an elite field receiver it it makes a defensive coordinator make decisions that usually open up the rest of your offense it usually opens up your running game some it usually gets the boundary receiver a little bit more room when you're when you don't have the threat at that position or a consistent threat, teams can say, well, let's move the safety over here and let's mm -hmm. move the safety into the box. And they don't have to honor that. And I think that's hurt the offensive line's look. All right. Uh, that's all we got for questions, Eric. Let's go ahead and talk some, uh, some more about Sam Hartman. Okay. So we're going to Sam. I am now. Um, and Sam is coming off the game of his career. The worst one he's ever had was as a freshman against Clemson, ironically. Um, and that was a Clemson team in 2018 that ended up blowing through Notre Dame in the semifinals 30-3 to and then trouncing Alabama in the championship game 44-16. to So that's not a bad team to have your worst game against. Um, so I guess Tyler, what, you know, he, he got talked about a lot today and maybe not in a really simplistic substantive way to kind of take a, take a bite out of. So I'm going to ask you, what do you make of Sam Hartman going into these last couple of games? Yeah. I, I, I tried to ask Marcus Freeman sort of what they saw and he didn't really give me a good answer, at least for my in my opinion, in terms of trying to give us specifics um, in terms of what he, what he wasn't doing well. And if those were new issues or issues that have uh, been recurring throughout the season. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm curious to see how he bounces back. I, I think he, I, I've never really taken Sam Hartman for as someone whose confidence gets rattled very much. Um, even when he's throwing interceptions, it's usually because he's taking chances. Um, and that's that's someone who's not confident, I feel like, doesn't take those ch chances. They'll they'll throw the ball away or they'll do other things or just run. Um, and he was running a bit uh, against Clemson. Um, and so I, I think I think we started to see more like that confidence starting to wane maybe for the first time um, during his Notre Dame tenure. Uh, I think maybe you could make an argument that Louisville game was was a little bit of the same, um, 
But yeah, I mean, I was charting like bad decisions and bad throws against Clemson, and I thought a quarter of his dropbacks there was either a bad decision or a bad throw. Um, they tried to stretch the field; it wasn't working. They were one of ten on passes of ten plus yards downfield, which is pretty pretty bad. <laughs> um, and so I don't know. Does that come back? It, it was that is that specific to Clemson, or is that specific to weaknesses in Notre Dame's passing game? You'd like to think that the defenses that Notre Dame will be playing against in these coming weeks um, won't present the same kind of challenges that Clemson did, but uh, I think I think Sam Hartman needs a little bit of a reset after after the Clemson loss because he took a lot of the blame and he, he wanted the blame after the game. Um, and I think rightfully so because I don't think that he gave his team the best chance to win. Um, where I don't know that um, you've, we've been able to say that very often this season, um, and so. How, how does he come back from that? Where does he sort of put the punctuation on, on his, on his Notre Dame career will be um, fascinating to see in the next couple of weeks. What do you think? What do you think we'll see from Sam Hartman? I think that he will have a good game against Wake Forest. It'll be his last game in Notre Dame stadium. And that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, wanting it, you're going to wish it into reality, but I do think, just given how hard he works, what a really good player he really is, I think we'll see a better version of Sam Hartman this week against his old team. He ought to know their defense pretty well. Hmm. Um, so, um, And I think he'll finish off well against Stanford. Stanford's defense is awful. They've, they've had little bursts of where they've been a little bit more of a complete team. I think they gave uh, Washington State a hard time defensively but I mean they're in the bottom five in just about every defensive category and then we'll see what he does after that but I mean right now even with as bad a game as he had he is sixth all time for passing efficiency in a single season at Notre Dame with a chance to climb back up with a couple good performances so that's that's pretty good company um Jack Cohn right now with Sam Hartman in slotted in there would be his season was eighth best. So that'll give you some comparison. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the thing that Pete Byrne asked me on our WSBT TV segment today, I'll ask it in a little bit different way. He asked me about Sam Hartman's legacy. I'm going to ask you, is Notre Dame better off for Sam Hartman having been at Notre Dame for a season and if so in what way it's funny because he asked me this way the, the way you asked this question is basically what he asked me during okay. our segment. <laughs> well you're already with your answer then uh so yeah I mean I think Notre Dame is better off uh what would have been the alternative right I think that you have to certainly consider right. that um Tyler Buckner staying like uh that didn't work out at, at Alabama necessarily um, would he have been more successful as Sam Hartman was this season? Um, I don't know that I have a lot of confidence in that. Um, would, how have the guys that are still here benefited from Sam Hartman's press presence? Um, I think, I, I think certainly Steve Angeli and Kenny Minchie have probably gained a lot from learning from Sam Hartman, both, both in his successes and his failures. Uh, and he seems to be a guy that really wants to help those guys. And so I think Notre Dame's better off for that. And I think you learn – Notre Dame as a program learns about more and more – I certainly we, – we saw it before with Jack Cohn, but that was a previous regime. So they, Marcus Freeman's going to learn about, okay, what what is the – what are the keys to making a grad transfer quarterback situation work, um, bringing in a quarterback who can start immediately – um, once he comes to Notre Dame, what did what did Notre Dame learn from the challenges that that brought and the experience and the benefits that that brought? Um, so I think all those things Notre Dame is better off for having done. I, I and it, say Hartman's gone, Buckner left too. Like would Steve Angeli as the starter have been better? I mean, I guess we, fans would know one way or the other whether or not they wanted him next year. Um, it's always everyone always wants the guy who they haven't seen enough of yet. Um, and so, 
they wouldn't be asking that about Steve Angeli um, because they would have uh, seen a season of him. And so uh, maybe they would be in the same position with asking, well, is it Kenny Minchie's turn? Why, why would we go to the grad transfer portal? Because we have Kenny Minchie in the way in the wing. So um, I think overall it was, it's definitely worth, worth what Notre Dame went through. I don't know that it, it Notre Dame got exactly what it wanted to out of it. Um, but that doesn't mean it didn't get enough out of it either. So uh, those are my thoughts. What do you think? Well, let me ask you before I give you my thinking, do you think this would have had a better a better ending had Tommy Reese stayed? I think so. Um, there, there was le- – certainly I don't know that Jared Parker changed a ton of things, but I do think there was more continuity there if Tommy Reese stayed. Um, and so you don't have to wor- worry about other people learning new things. You're just sort of focusing on teaching the new quarterback that um, versus – teaching not only uh, your players, new teams like Jared Parker, learning how to be a coordinator, Gino Guduli having to learn what's being taught. There's just, there was just a lot of people having to learn at the same right. time, which you wouldn't have had if Tommy Reese stayed. Um, I'm not, Tommy Reese certainly isn't um, infallible, but I, I think that uh, he probably would have gotten better out of this offense and Sam Hartman. If, if he were the one to, uh, if he, if he were the one to have uh, been the coordinator this past season, do you agree with that? I do. I I'm I wasn't sure about that at the beginning of the season as I've seen it play out. I definitely feel it, and especially with what Marcus Freeman said today about, you know, this is Sam Hartman's first year in a new system after being in the same system for five years. And I think Tommy would have been able to bridge that difference a little bit better uh, than I think Gino Gadouli is going to be an excellent quarterbacks coach, and I think he already is. But he was learning the offense in February (laughs) before spring practice started. Right. And I will say this, as much as Alabama's quarterback situation and offense was kind of a mess in September, Jalen Milrow is fifth in the country in pass efficiency right now. Um, they're, They're hitting their stride offensively right now, so... As far as, yeah, I do think Notre Dame is better off Sam Hartman having been here. Mm -hmm. I think it, um, I think Notre Dame has a better record than they would have had with either Tyler Buckner or Drew Pine. And I think it was worth that risk that either or both would leave. You still have some good prospects coming up behind Sam Hartman who benefited a lot from him being around, from his good habits, from who who probably know the system as well or better uh, than him, at least Steve Angeli. I think he really benefited uh, from Sam Hartman being here. Mm -hmm. And I think it brought a certain, I don't want to say sparkle, but it brought a certain status to the program having a guy pick Notre Dame that was the poor. Notre Dame has not, didn't develop quarterbacks in a consistent way during the Brian Kelly era and maybe not during the Marcus Freeman era so far. But I do think um, when we get beyond this year and look back at it, we'll look at it more fondly than maybe we do right after a bad loss to Clemson. So um, do we want to get into the next portal quarterback or go to questions first? Uh, let's go to the next portal quarterback because I know there's at least one question about that. So let's go ahead and talk about it anyways. I can even throw up the question from, from Irish fan while we're talking about it. Go ahead. So, um, you know, Marcus Freeman a couple weeks ago had said, uh, when I asked him about possibility of a portal quarterback this year said, well, we probably will decide that during the second bye week. So I thought, I'll remember that. So I asked him today, and he said, indeed, they have decided that they would add a portal quarterback. Now, he tried to be um, a little bit more vague about, you know, whether this is a starter, whether this is a backup. I don't think that you get portal quarterbacks to come to your program if they don't think they have a chance to start. Um, And so I think this would be somebody that you're, you're out looking for a starter. And he went through the process a little bit too, which I think was interesting. I think we all assumed, but they're looking at, at guys. They don't even know whether they're going to be in the portal or not. They're doing playing the same game we are, the same game you guys are. Mm-hmm. They're picking guys that say, hey, 
it'd be great if, and I'm just using an example, Michael Pratt wanted to transfer for his last year of eligibility or Cam Rising or somebody like that. And so they're looking and doing evaluations because they want to be ready to roll when that portal opens on December 4th and guys start jumping in there, they want to be able to try to get in the mix right away and decide whether they want to pursue that player or not once they're in there. And mm-hmm. so um, I thought that was pretty interesting. But yeah, they're going to go that direction. They would like to get to four scholarship quarterbacks. It could mean that they lose a scholarship quarterback. Right. I know that uh, C.J. Carr, the incoming freshman, has been quoted as saying he welcomes having a portal guy this year. I don't think he'd be happy the following year, nor do I mm-hmm. think Notre Dame is necessarily, unless they had lost two quarterbacks, that they would they would go back to the portal um, the following year. I think they they would have a nice cycle going of talent that they could have compete to be a starting quarterback. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the starter, it, it probably needs to be a starter. Um, I think I agree with that decision to get to uh, um, Irish fans questioned. I think that Notre Dame should bring in another grad transfer for quarterback next year. I think that's the most likely solution. Maybe maybe they bring in a freshman. I, that seems l- less likely Those, in terms of like the possibilities of bringing in a, fr- a transfer regardless of who it is, whether it's a quarterback or someone else. Grad transfer is the easiest, and then freshman is usually the second easiest in terms of being able to get the credits to transfer. And, and sometimes that's just ignoring the credits <laughs> for the most part and having them start all the way over. But it's easier to convince a freshman to do that um, than someone who's spent three years in, in a college and is that close to graduating elsewhere, um, and they wouldn't necessarily be that close to graduating at Notre Dame. Um, so... I think that's what Notre Dame will do. I, I mean, it's nice to have Marcus Freeman say that today because I think we've we've been saying for a while that we expect that this is what Notre Dame will do. Um, I think it shows the transparency with which Marcus Freeman operates with his players um, that they are they are aware of this. Like they didn't just find this out through the press conference today. Um, those those quarterbacks know um, what what the plan is. Um, and they can feel some type of way about that, but that's um, the reality of the situation. If if Notre Dame didn't bring in Sam Hartman, um, there's there would still have been competition going into this past season and maybe even next season. So I don't think that it, it changes a lot of things in terms of like the 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 future that Steve Angeli or Kenny Minchie thought they were getting into when they came to Notre Dame. Um, and, and so I think it. It's about as safe of a move as you can make, I think. Um, and maybe who's to say, like this grad, this grad transfer that Notre Dame gets, maybe Steve Angeli still beats him out. Like there's, there's yeah. no rule like th- against that. Like, uh, and that's happened places. I mean, the NC State quarterback Brennan Armstrong got beaten out. Then the kid decides last week, hey, I want a red shirt. <laughs> so Brennan Armstrong was back in the starting lineup Saturday, but. I mean, there there's quite a few quarterbacks that were grad transfers or transfers that got beaten out by somebody on the roster. That happens. Yeah, and I, even uh, the guy at uh, Oklahoma State, I can't think of his name. Um, Bowman. Yeah, oh. like he like he's been he was transferring. I don't know that he thought. I don't know that anyone knew who the Oklahoma State quarterback was going to be this season. Um, and so there was there was a process of getting to that. Um, and, and so I, I think that, uh, you, you never really know. It could be a guy that you get to, to come in and start right away. It could be a guy that maybe Steve Angeli beats out and then maybe something else happens and you have to turn to him. I think Phil Jacoba uh, got beaten out. Right. Yeah. I think you, in an ideal world, it's not a guy that transfers in, wins the starting job and then loses his job because then something bad has happened. You don't want that bad. To, you want that bad to happen for the, for that grad transfer before the season starts rather than during the season, because that's going to impact your win loss record. Okay. Do we want to hit the question portal? Yeah, let's hit the question portal. Um, Air, uh, from Timothy Holland, any chance Charlie Weiss could come back to run the offense next year? I recall him saying, Post sideline accident in Notre Dame that he prefers the view from the press box. There's chatter amongst the fans. Okay, Timothy, are you guys at a bar right now? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, Charlie was, and and I say this in all seriousness, Charlie was a pretty good offensive coordinator whenever he had that job. When he went down to Florida, he did a good job with it. He was at Kansas City for one year after he left Notre Dame before he, I think, before he went to Florida. Um, it's been the head coaching that's kind of snagged him, but I think he's done. I think the Charlie Weiss you would want is the other Charlie Weiss who Charlie Weiss Sr. no longer wants to be called Charlie Weiss Jr. He thinks he's earned the right to that name without a uh, period at the end of it So, and two letters. So, uh, But the Charlie Weiss Jr. that's at Ole Miss, I don't know that he would – he would be available. And I don't know that Marcus is going to change offensive coordinators in the off season, but I do think he needs to really evaluate that and decide, do I have one of the top 10 to 12 offensive coordinators in the country on my staff? Because Notre Dame deserves that. Yeah. I think that's an important clarification. I don't, I don't know where the the chatter amongst fans is, is about the elder Charlie Weiss. Um, it's the, the younger Charlie Weiss is the one that people. I don't know if it's how how much they actually want him, or they just think it's sort of interesting or entertaining, uh, potentially. Uh, but uh, I, I that that was that's the chatter that I've seen. I haven't seen uh, former Notre Dame head coach Charlie Weiss being banned. Ban- bandied about in terms of being uh, Notre Dame's next offensive coordinator. All right. Brendan McCarthy asked, what is your favorite senior day memory? Okay. So Brendan, I saw offered one on Twitter that is actually one of mine. And so I don't want to steal that from him. Um, so, I mean, I'll say one that's more recent than the example he gave, which was back uh, about 16 years ago. I think the one with Brandon Wimbush was pretty cool where Ian Book was hurt. Notre Dame needed in 2018 Brandon Wimbush to come and start against Florida State. I mean, it wasn't a great Florida State team, but that was a losable game. And Brandon Wimbush, who was the ultimate team guy, played great. Notre Dame makes the playoff that year, and they save Ian Book from having to get pounded on against Florida State. And uh, Brandon really enjoyed – we had him on our podcast, and he talked about how special that game was and kind of being able to go full circle and come back and, and do something to help the team at the end. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would need more time to go back and figure out like I, the senior day moments with the the parents. I think are are kind of cool, and yeah. sometimes there's some funny celebrations or or, or uh, moments there uh, with with Day's parents. Mom. And so, say that again, Sheldon Day's mom. Sheldon Day's mom. That's yes, my really. baby. Yeah, yeah, that that would come to to mind. Um, a more recent one, uh, Myron Tangavaloa Mosa returning a fumble for a touchdown on senior day was uh was a pretty cool moment um <laughs> having him have that opportunity there's a number of guys that sort of get their last chances there even even when it's the walk-ons late i think that's cool um for guys to get out there and be able to to play in their last game at Notre Dame Stadium so um i would need i would need more time to sort of call a list um but those those are some of the things that come to my mind immediately uh, Brendan McCarthy has another one. Uh, I'm, while I send this to you, I'm going to look through the chat for some more questions. I know there's been a lot of stuff submitted. Uh, Brendan McCarthy asked, uh, who's one player who was overrated this year and one who was underrated this year? By me or by everybody that was overrated and underrated? I don't know. Brendan, you want to chime in and let us know? Okay. I'll, I'll start thinking of in general terms and not put myself on the spot of who I overrated. I would say <laughs> overrated, probably Blake Fisher and underrated. I mean, JJB, Javante, Jean Baptiste surprised me. I'm trying to think. Um, I was a big Xavier Watts fan. Otherwise, I would say him. 
Um, I I would say those would be the uh, underrated. Did I say an underrated? I I'll go with JJB as my underrated. All right, now Brennan is clarifying oh. that he wants to put yourself on the spot. Okay. Um, and you came up with a good one the other day. Thomas Harper uh, was a guy that was underrated. I, I overrated Tobias. That was probably my my biggest overrated guy. And um, I underrated probably Howard Cross. I thought he was a good player. I didn't know he had a chance to be this good. Yeah, I I did this exercise, revisited this in the middle of the season because I, I did like a top 25 um, yeah. before the season in terms of players. So <laughs> I had Billy Shrout in my top 15, I think. Right. I had I had Billy Shrout. I don't at think eight. I'm right. I had Billy Shrout at 18. That was too high. Um, I was too high on Blake Fisher, who I had at number six. Um, Tobias Merriweather I had at number 11. Um, those are probably the guys that I overrated the most. Um, underrated, I should have been higher on Howard Cross. I had him at 10th. I think he should even go higher than that. I had Cam Hart at 12th. He should have been higher than that. Um, I didn't include Maris Leofile on my list, so that was probably um, under ranking, underrating him. Um, and then, There's some days where he is and some days where he isn't. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, and then I, I – Thomas Harper, like you mentioned before, I had him at 21. I think he's probably higher on that list um, given the way the season has played out. So I would say I underrated him as as well. And an Irish fan with an easy, definitely an easy one for underrated, uh, Jordan Faison. Um, that's someone that uh, wasn't on the rated system <laughs> uh, for most of us. But as I, as a, I will say this. I remember us having conversations going, who's 80? That guy's a walk-on heat. That's somebody that might help them down the road. I I do think at least we identified that part of it. Yeah, once once practice started um, and we were able to see um, guys doing things, it was like, wow, Jordan Faison, he's he's got a little wiggle there, and he's he's a pretty pretty electric guy. I I didn't necessarily know that that that, that would mean he'd end up playing this season. Jo- um, Jordan but- Faison and Luke Talich were the two walk ons that jumped out at you at practice. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Talich just jumps out physically at you because he's so big. Um, Ed Coquillard has a good another one. Jordan Botello is someone that was overrated. That's probably... Yeah, uh, that was my fault. Yeah. That's probably... I did, I did do that. Probably that's fair cool. as well. <laughs> um, Thanks, Ed. <laughs> I don't think you're alone in that, so let's not say that uh, uh, it's all your fault. Um R underscore Riley submitted a lot of things and more demands and suggestions than questions, but I was going to run through this and see what you thought of it. Um, Freeman needs to hire new coaches for the offensive line, wide receiver, quarterback, offensive coordinator, defensive lines, strong safeties, or maybe just safeties in general, uh, special teams and strength and conditioning. He needs to be rebuild the recruiting office and the university needs to invest more money in coaches and DGAs. Um, I would disagree with some of the. Uh, yeah, what it, I guess what I was most interested in. What do you disagree with most from that? W- well, okay, and I will say what I do think is a good idea. I would say. I would say, I disagree the most with the wide receivers coach. I think his recruiting is part of the solution. He's playing three freshmen, the most snaps. Uh, I, I think you're giving up on him too quick. That would be the one I least agree with uh, as far as changing. I, I'd say that they a lot of those guys at different times have deserved criticism. Um, the defensive line coach, Al Washington's had a pretty good year, right. even though he did not – pull in Justin Scott or hasn't yet. Uh, I don't anticipate that happening. I think he's had a pretty good year on the field. Uh, As far as rebuilding the recruiting office, I don't know that you need to rebuild it. They did some of that this off season and brought in some extra personnel. What's the guy from Arkansas's name? Benton. um, Mm, Is it Butler? Benton Butler. Uh, 
Butler yeah. Benton. Butler Benton. You have a background. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Butler Benton. Um, but I think where I would agree with, I assume this isn't Ruth Riley, um, R. <laughs> Riley, is that uh, I would like to see not just analysts who are really good at providing information in the middle of the game, but analysts that have institutional knowledge, that have good college football knowledge. And David Cutcliffe's name always comes up. I don't know that he's even interested in that. But somebody like that who's been around the game, who can provide some really good ideas when fixing needs to be done, somebody that's done a lot of fixing, I wouldn't mind seeing some expansion in the analyst um, core with someone like that. Um, and our, our Riley says GAs, ex head coaches. That that's not how graduate assistants work. GAs are people who are working to, as as to get graduate degrees. They are young. You have to be recent college graduates or like a uh, a former player, um, which James Laurinaitis was somehow uh, qualified for that. Um, uh, so you're you're not getting ex head coaches to be your GAs. The, those are those they could be analysts, but they're not they're not GAs. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I just, I, I think safeties as well. Like, I don't know why, uh, uh, O'Leary's head would be on the chopping block. I mean, look at Xavier Watts. I mean, he's arguably one of Notre Dame's best players. Um, and he was a guy Notre Dame didn't even recruit to play defense. Um, certainly I think he could do a better job recruiting. Um, but I think the play on the field has been pretty good at the safety position this year. Um, and, I think that he was did pull in Bronte Johnson this year, which was a good, good pull. Yep. Safety. Sure. Um, and uh, I think, I think safeties was one of the bigger question marks going into the season. And I don't think it's been that uh, I think he's, he's done a good job. And uh, um, I did see um, R Riley mentioning that Notre Dame's defensive line doesn't produce enough sacks under Al Washington. So yeah, um, I, I would agree that they don't produce a lot of sacks this year. Uh, it's not that wasn't the case last season. Um, Notre Dame was 15th in the country in sacks, um, so um, I think I think we're sort of cherry picking um, things there. I, I think I, I think the offensive coordinator certainly is fair. Maybe quarterbacks coach. I think Gino Gadulli is put in a, a, a bit of a tough spot um, with how how he was put there, um, and certainly strength and conditioning is open for. Uh, a, a, a full search this off season. Um, so those are the things that I would agree with that our Riley said suggested. All right. Uh, Jeffrey St Stevens asked uh, regarding 2024 recruiting, there has been less drama this year than previous years. Do you think it's due to the Marcus Freeman pro policy of no official visits to other schools once committed or something else? Well, knock wood because, uh, you know, we still have another month. <laughs> the drama, you, the, the biggest drama yeah. usually happens in December. <laughs> yeah. But I would say, I mean, maybe they just got a better read on players that they thought would be drama free, that they thought, okay, let's not go for somebody that's going to be like Peyton Bowen was last year, where he was constantly visiting other schools that you never really got the sense he was going to end up in the class. And then at the last minute, you don't have him. Um, I, I think they try to get, get a better read. And I also think the recruits probably had a better read on the whole NIL scene than they did the first, than last year's class did when there was money being thrown at a lot of players and Notre Dame, I just think had a better feel. So while they may not have gotten as many five stars, they are going to be able to retain, it looks like, the players that they did pull in uh, this year. So that would be my take on it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the price you pay for recruiting five stars. You want five stars, you're going to have to deal with drama. There's not you, You're rarely going to deal with five stars that aren't going to be in situations where they're getting offered, um, especially under the, the current era, NIL money um, and opportunities elsewhere. Um, Notre Dame has a lot of guys that are borderline five stars. And so maybe that happens down the stretch. 
Notre Dame likes where it's at with its commits. There isn't necessarily a threat of anyone decommitting at the moment. Um, its top guys are CJ Carr, who's certainly been fully committed to Notre Dame, Kingston Villiamuasa, um, who's been fully committed to Notre Dame. Um, so Notre Dame has done a good job in getting it. The, the guys at the top of his class are guys that seem to be fully invested in the Irish uh, so far. And like, like we mentioned, the December is when, especially when there's coaching changes across the country that could shake things up um, and, and cause some situations that um, may be more attractive to those guys who are committed to Notre Dame than they previous were, previously were before. Um, or maybe Notre Dame's becomes less attractive because someone leaving or something like that. So there's any number of things that could happen uh, between now and the early signing period. But um, Notre Dame has has encouraged guys to not officially visit, and so that, that certainly helps. Um, they want guys that once you're committed, you're committed to us um, and use your official visits before you commit to us if that's what you want to do. Um, and so Notre Dame – um, has has been in a good spot with that. And that, that happens when you get those guys that commit early in the summer. A lot of those guys did take official visits to other schools as well or had the opportunity to if they wanted to before they committed. So um, that sort of all adds up into where Notre Dame's at um, with uh, its, its top commits in this 2024 cycle. All right, Eric, I don't know that there's any other questions here to pull from. Uh, is there anything else we want to hit on before we get out of here? Okay, let's see. We talked about red shirts. Uh, seniors, uh, seniors with eligibility left. The one thing that I'll mention is they're going to honor 31 seniors on Saturday. Seven have no eligibility left. So the other 24 and a lot of underclassmen are going to have decisions to make. Marcus Freeman said today none of those have been made. They've given him some information then they're going to revisit after the Stanford game. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask before we just do a couple of recruiting tidbits, Pete Sampson deserves an A for all the different ways he tried to ask the George Jared Parker counterpunch question today. <laughs> do you feel like we got any insight into that? I mean, if you read through the whole thing that Marcus threw out there in response to that, do you feel like Marcus gave us an answer that we can grasp? Uh, I would say no. I, I I think that Marcus Freeman, like his answer in short was it's easier said than done. Um, but I don't know that um, he gave us a lot to understand Jared Parker's ability to do so. Um, and or whether that was a area of growth that of needed growth. Right. Um, I think one thing, one thing that we've given Jared Parker a lot of credit for, and maybe we, maybe in retrospect gave him too much credit for was the NC state unbalanced line being a, a sort of counter punch, but it was something that they talked about that they had prepared to use all week, just sort of the way the game broke out um, with the delay. And then the first play is out of that formation. It's an 80 yard touchdown. It's like, Oh, there's the counter punch. Maybe it wasn't really a counter punch. Maybe it was something that Notre Dame was always planning to do and hadn't. Maybe it was lightning it. delay hot dogs. <laughs> um, I so I, I so I don't know. Like I, I know I asked Jared Parker at one point this season, like when you're struggling, when the, we have all this talk about execution and you have to fix your execution, you got to know what you can do well. Like if you're spending all this time on executing your basic plays that you're not executing on the field. Like how can you? How much time do you have to add new wrinkles to the offense? And do you have that capability? And he admitted, yeah. I mean, that limits your opportunities to do stuff like that. And obviously, every week you want to have something that you feel like is attacking the opposing defense and the weaknesses that you see in it. But it's harder to execute those things when you can't execute the things that you've been working on all season. Um, so, if Parker had a lot of those things in his back pocket, I think you would have. You'd like to think that he'd have used them in games by now. Um, so I don't know. Play action is like grade grade level one counter punch, right? Run the ball, then run play action. Notre Dame doesn't do enough of that. Um, that's the whole concept. It's not being used enough. I we have I have not received a, an answer that to me makes sense of why they're not doing it. Um, and so I think uh, I'm, I imagine that'll be something that Jared Parker has to has to discuss uh, when we talk to him on Tuesday. 
Okay, a couple of recruiting tidbits. Dominic Hulak, 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 Hulak verbally committed. What what's Notre Dame getting in a 2025 edge player in Dominic Hulak? Yeah, six foot three, two thirty five, out of Elmhurst, Illinois. I see Catholic Prep uh, plays primarily linebacker, but plays some rush end. Um, Notre Dame has recruited him as a viper with some linebacker possibilities. We've seen in recent cycles that Notre Dame. Um, has has targeted linebackers as potential vipers. Um, he's a three-star recruit, the number 19 line inside linebacker in the 2025 class. But in talking to our rivals analyst team, it sounds like he's someone who'll be in under heavy consideration for ratings and ratings bump um, upon the next update based on his junior season. He has size and speed. Um, not necessarily a proven rush end, but uh, we'll see what that that ends up being. But he is someone that you, you sort of understand the projection for him and then Cree Thomas is a young man in the 2025 class who's going to make his uh, decision known his college decision known a week from today Um, and what can you tell us about Cree Thomas that's not going to get you in trouble Tyler Uh, he's six foot one 170 pounds Uh, he's from Phoenix Brophy Prep which is the same school that Benjamin Morrison went to um, so a pretty good place to look for cornerbacks, potentially. He's only a three-star recruit, the number 31 cornerback in the country. That's right around where Benjamin Morrison was ranked, uh, ironically enough. Um, although Benjamin Morrison, I believe, was a four-star in the rival system. Um, Wisconsin and Arizona are probably the biggest threats to Notre Dame. I've had a rival's future cast prediction in for um, Cree Thomas since last month. I still think that prediction comes true. Um, and I've had a pretty good track record with those, not to toot my own horn so far, but uh, gave folks on the insider lounge a heads up that I believe Dominic Hulak would pick Notre Dame, and then he ended up announcing for Notre Dame. So uh, that's just uh, another reason that you should subscribe to us at InsideNDSports.com to receive the information that we want to give our subscribers on the insider lounge. Um, And uh, as we mentioned earlier um, and throughout the show, we have a 30-day free trial going on. Um, that you can use N- code NDYT um, to take advantage of, uh, get access to our premium analysis or recruiting coverage and everything we're doing over on the Insider Lounge. So I sort of worked my uh, promo bit into the end there with the recruiting coverage, Eric. Uh, is there anything else you want to uh, get? Uh, make sure that we mention before we get out of here tonight? The reason I can wear a short sleeve shirt during the show is because my legacy heating and air furnace is working perfectly. I love legacy heating and air conditioning. If you live in the South Bend area, check them out. I mean, they are, even if you have another brand, another, have them come fix your furnace if you have problems because they are really, really good at it. That's how I ended up being a legacy customer when it was time to get a new one because they did such a good job, better job than the company I had. Uh, Do we have time for one more question? Are we done, Tyler? Um, do we have a question that you saw that you want to add? No, I, I just, I just gave you a chance to grab one more on the way out the door. Otherwise, give us a like, hit the notification bell and everything Tyler said at the beginning of the show that I don't know how to do. <laughs> yeah. Subscribe to our channel here. Uh, like comment, let us know what you'd like us to discuss, to discuss, um, in future shows or even on our podcast later this week, we have some, a submission still open to that over on Twitter. If you you can find me at, at T James ND, Eric's at E Hanson ND. Um, <laughs> send us questions for the podcast that we we'll record on Tuesday. Um, we'll be back here on YouTube for Place Your Bets uh, for the Wake Forest game on Friday, um, and then we'll be back after the game with our post game takeaways. Um, and I hope you guys have enjoyed the bye week um, and are ready for us to get back to football. I will say one thing on on my bye week. I did see an offense that struggled more than Jared Parker's at times has this season. And that was my grandson Rio's basketball team. They opened their season and they scored two points for the whole game. Oh, wow. Hopefully second and third grade basketball team. Were those Rio's points? They were not Rio's points. He did not <laughs> touch the ball either offensively or defensively oh, boy. in the game. They had 17 <laughs> kids to work through and oh, maybe no. the chemistry – 
contributed to them only scoring two points. So what's the math? Every every kid accounted for an eighth of a point, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I think the one that actually found it himself in the hoop was probably a mistake. They almost had a kid score for the other team. He he had a breakaway and didn't realize the reason nobody was chasing him was because he was about to shoot in the wrong basket. All right. Well, hopefully there aren't uh, comically bad offense uh, being played uh, by Notre Dame uh, uh, basketball or football this week. Um, uh, We hope you guys enjoy the week and we appreciate you guys joining us here this evening.